My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Dr. Haber is a Blair chiropractor at a Precision Chiropractic in Rancho Santa Margarita, California. She has been one of the biggest influences in my life and has taught me almost everything I know about Blair Chiropractic. She is my mentor and it is such an honor to have her on the podcast today because she possesses the biggest heart and has the most compassion out of anyone I've ever met. She has such an amazing life story and has overcome so many obstacles in her life and I am very excited to have her on today. Please welcome Dr. Hafer. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? I'm so good. Dr. Pekka, good to hear from you. Yeah. Dr. Hafer, where are you from? I am originally from Davenport, Iowa, the birthplace of chiropractic. That's right. Did you love growing up in Iowa? I love being from Iowa, which means that I had a phenomenal upbringing and what good work ethic looks like and just learning how to be a kind person. But I don't live in Iowa because there's this thing called winter. And actually, the funny thing is I was just back in Iowa a couple weeks ago. My best girlfriend from chiropractic school had her fifth baby. So I went home to help her for a week. And while I was there at the end of February, beginning of March, not only was it weird warm there, but there were tornadoes. And I forgot how much I disdain the violent storms that the Midwest produces. So winter and storms are not my favorite. And living in Southern California, they don't have any of those things. So it's it's really nice. That's right. That is correct. No tornadoes in uh, Southern California. That's exactly right. So you have one of my favorite life stories growing up. And I like it so much because you've overcome so much in your life. That's pretty amazing. So if you could just talk about just your upbringing in Iowa, what was that like for you? So, you know, Iowa is a great place to be from. Unfortunately, I grew up under some pretty you know, tough circumstances. When I was two years old, actually on Christmas Eve, 1982, my mother left us, my family, and she never returned. So I kind of had that abandonment issue with my biological mother. And then based on that, my dad sort of had some issues with alcohol and just, you know, brokenness. And so as I grew older, he was not handling all that stress very well. And he was a very abusive person, physically, mentally, emotionally. And, you know, there was a lot of turmoil and abuse in my life as a child. And when I was 13 years old, I was living with him, my second stepmother, my brother, in this little tiny town called Pleasant Valley, Iowa, right on the Mississippi River. And I was in such a horrible place emotionally, and it was just really, really, really overwhelming. It was the first time that I actually tried to kill myself. And and it didn't work, obviously, because I'm here talking to you today. But at 13 years old, for a young girl to make that choice, it's just so heartbreaking. And I suffered with severe depression and suicidal thoughts and attempts for many years. And it wasn't until I was 27 that my life changed. And we can get into that, but... It just started out really, really tough. And I didn't come from a place where there was a lot of emotional support. I definitely had kind of material things taken care of. I had a roof over my head. I had clothes to wear. And it's interesting because from an outside perspective, if you were to look at me, look at my family, look at the dynamics, you wouldn't know the amount of suffering that was happening behind closed doors. But emotionally, it was destructive. So how was high school for you? You mentioned that was like, what, middle school where everything was like started going on or... Yes. Well, I lived with my father until I was about 14, on and off. And then when I was 14, the state of Iowa got involved in our family dynamic because my dad, like I said, was physically abusive. And there were circumstances that were happening where my friend's parents started to become aware that it wasn't right what was happening. So they called the Department of Human Services and 
the Department of Human Services had come several times to do investigations. And um, on the final investigation, they recommended that it wasn't safe for me to live there anymore. So I came home from eighth grade one day and all my stuff was out on the street at the end of my dad's driveway. And I was told, you're not going to live here anymore. Who told you that? My father. Really? Yeah. He said, you're not welcome. If you step foot on my property, I'm going to call the police. Jesus Christ. Eighth grade? I was in eighth grade. I was 14 at this point. Yeah. So I ended up moving to his mother's house, his mother and father's house and I finished eighth grade out at the junior high that I was going to but I commuted you know my grandmother drove me to school every day and then in high school I ended up going to Bettendorf High School she lived in Bettendorf my grandma and grandpa they lived in Bettendorf so I lived with them you know the end of eighth grade through the middle of my senior year and high school was okay I thrived in high school as far as academics and I was involved in musical theater and I played softball so again Outside looking in, you'd think, what the heck does this girl have any issues with? Well, was the living situation any better? I mean, because, I mean, your grandparents obviously raised your father. So was there anything? You know what? My dad, you know, I think he was a broken person from the failed relationship with my mother. And obviously that had taken place, you know, 16 years or something before that. Right. And I wasn't abused physically from my grandparents. Absolutely not. But I think that, you know the generation gap and the era of my grandparents and yeah. and in the Midwest it's just this different culture where you don't talk about things everything gets swept under the rug and I was struggling I was sad I was depressed and I would tell my grandmother I'm hurting I need help yeah. and she would just kind of tell me like well, you just need to suck it up and get over it. And that's kind of like the attitude that they had, you know, growing up. And she was born in 1936. She was literally born during the Depression. So there was no, you know, let's talk about our feelings. It was just get up, get up, do work, move on. So unfortunately, there was this gap in understanding. And and that's not like I, I blame her. I totally understand where she was coming from. But at the same time, I was a very hurting person. So yeah, I got through high school by the skin of my teeth. My junior year, I met my oldest daughter, Lauren's dad, Robert, and I met him and we started dating. And by the middle of my senior year, I was so discontented living with my family. And I just thought if I could just get out of here, my life will get better. Yeah. So I ended up moving in with Robert when I was 17 and a half and I moved in with him and his mom and his sister and I actually just like uh, basically like not legally but I just emancipated myself. I just decided I'm transferring high schools and I changed everything. I moved across town and I ended up, you know, graduating high school with Robert and working. I had a couple of jobs when I was in high school and I saved up enough money by the time that I was 18 and a half, you know, in all of my wisdom yeah. to get my own apartment and I actually was on my own fully. The issue with that is as soon as I moved into my own apartment, Robert of course moved in with me and literally a month after getting my own apartment, I got pregnant with my oldest daughter who's about to turn 18. So I went from kind of like this emotionally dysfunctional place to all of a sudden being a pregnant unwed teenager and there was a lot of stress that goes along with that. And I couldn't imagine. I had Lauren when I was 19. And then two months after she was born, Robert and I got married. And we were married at 19. And it was, you know, like when you come from dysfunction and when you come from not so much support emotionally, you don't really pick people that are emotionally stable to be your partner. So I went from one bad situation to another. And we weren't in any position to necessarily make that choice to get married. My family kind of put pushed me into it. Obviously, I made the decision, but I was heavily influenced by people saying things like, you're never going to find anybody to love you. You're lucky he pays attention to you. You have a kid. You need to marry him. That's just, that's awful. So that circumstance obviously sets one up for phenomenal success in life, right? And here I am, 19 years old, you know, married, have a brand new baby, and I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I just knew that I needed to take care of my baby and and not abandon her the way that my mother abandoned me. Right. And meanwhile, I'm dealing with a raging mental illness, yeah. you know, depression and suicidal ideology. And Were you diagnosed uh, with anything at this point? You know, okay. at this point, just depression. And I had been on and off medication. They had given me Zoloft and Effexor and... I think even some thyroid medication. Did that work? Any of that stuff work for you? It did not. It did not work. In fact, it just made me sicker. So I kept going to the mental health professionals in my town and they just kept making me more sick with medication. And it was just a really horrible situation. So unfortunately, 
um, made another decision when I was 20 that I was going to move to California and start over. And it wasn't like it was a bad decision, right? but it wasn't the right time. So I always say California is the right place. It just wasn't the right time. Yeah. So I had gotten into a fight with Robert and I just realized like this is an unhealthy situation. And for my daughter, I can't have her be around this. Like it's just not appropriate. So I moved to California and lived in Lakewood and Long Beach for about, I guess, nine months. And while I was in California, I literally had like a mental breakdown. I had psychotic episodes. I was having all these crazy thoughts and I got checked into a mental hospital in Anaheim where they were able to diagnose me with bipolar disorder. And they said that I was bipolar too with rapid cycling. And that's pretty much one of the worst diagnoses you can get. And they put me on lithium and Respiradol. Respiradol is an antipsychotic and... All the while, I'm just pumping this medication into my system and not getting any better. It's actually ruining my body and my thyroid, and I'm packing on weight and getting puffy and not getting better. And you just had no control like over your thoughts, right? Like You probably desperately wanted to get better and feel better, but did you have any control over those thoughts that were coming I to you? I didn't have control over the thoughts, and I definitely wanted to get better. And that's why I kept seeking out mental health professionals, because that's what I thought was wrong. And right. I just had this overwhelming desire to not live anymore. And the only thing that really kept me going was the fact that I needed to be a mom for Lauren. And it's so sick because even though I was present with her physically, emotionally and mentally, I wasn't present because I was so ill. And thankfully, I had some really incredible people in my life who believed for me and just kept showing up. My friends, Amy and Brian Smith and my friend Kim Hutchison, like these people were instrumental in keeping me alive because they wouldn't let me give up. And they just kept saying, just get up one more day. And even though it was miserable, I just kept going forward. So I had some angels in my life throughout my life that kept me going. And then Kim was the one that was responsible for me getting a job at Palmer. She had just mentioned, hey, when you figure out what you want to do with your life, you know, go to school. But until then, why don't you work at Palmer College? So after I had the diagnosis of bipolar disorder and had that breakdown, I moved back to Iowa so I could have a little bit more support for Lauren. And it was a lot less expensive to live in the Midwest and being a single mom. So I moved back and I got the job at Palmer College in May of 2001. And I really loved working there. I loved what I was seeing. The interesting thing is I grew up under chiropractic care. I just was never educated about the power of chiropractic. It was like, if you have a headache, if you have back pain, if you get in a car accident, you go see a chiropractor. And we really went based on symptoms. We didn't have like this philosophy of, I need to do this for wellness. And so I got a job working at Palmer and I saw these student doctors helping these people from the community and people would come in and their lives would be changing. And I was just like, this is fascinating. And I can't believe I never even recognized this about chiropractic. So I started doing more investigation and I learned about the chiropractic technology program that Palmer offered. And I thought I could do this. It's a two year degree. I could be a bigger part of these people's lives. I could take the exams, take the x-rays, build the insurance, assist the doctor. What a great career that would be. And that's all I kind of thought like for myself because I barely graduated high school, not because I wasn't smart, because I had such horrible depression. It was hard for me to show up every day. And I just knew that I wanted to be a bigger part of this profession. So in March of 2002, I actually started college on my 22nd birthday and it was the associate's degree and it was just so exciting. And then about halfway through that program, I started really understanding more about this thing called chiropractic and the power that is in what we do. And I realized that I didn't want to just be an assistant the rest of my life because I was so interested in understanding how the body works and why these things happen. And I really wanted to know more about the cycle of when patients come in and what they get done and how it works and track them along the way. And also I knew that I couldn't really take direction for the rest of my life because I kind of have a big personality. So halfway through the CT program, I started looking into what it would take to become a doctor of chiropractic. And I was terrified Yeah, because I was still suffering from depression, but it was a little bit more under control because I was getting regular chiropractic care. And at that point, I wasn't taking medication anymore. I was just getting adjusted and getting checked and it kept me going, but I was still like had these overwhelming suicidal thoughts. So even though I wasn't on medication and I wasn't having these highs and lows, I was still overwhelmingly 
occupied with I don't want to live anymore and the thing that kept me going was I got to provide a better life for Lauren so I feel like God doesn't make mistakes and he gave me my beautiful Lauren to kind of keep me going and full spine chiropractic got me through enough to that I didn't take medication and I wasn't being drugged and I was able to think a little bit clearer yeah and I started chiropractic college the doctor of chiropractic program in November of 2004 and I remember I sat down on the bench in one of the rooms at Palmer College and I circled the date October 24th 2008 I knew that was the day I was going to be graduating as a doctor and I envisioned myself getting to that point and I had absolutely no clue what it was going to take to get me there and it was an incredible journey and I made some amazing friends that are lifelong that were instrumental in my advancement through the program Angela Ferris and Jackie Dukes and Patrick Newhouse, these people like were instrumental in my journey. And it wasn't until I was a year away from graduating chiropractic school that my life changed for the better and for a complete twist in the course of the way that I was going to live the rest of my life. And it came because I was slipping back into some severe depression. And Jackie, my best girlfriend, who was the one that had the fifth baby and still lives in Iowa, her and her husband have a practice. She told me, listen, you've done everything you can. You've taken medication. You've done full spine chiropractic. You've done all this other stuff. Why don't you try this thing called Blair Upper Cervical? And we had learned about it as an elective right. in our toggle class, which is is another kind of technique that chiropractic has to offer. And I said, you know what, Jack, there's no way that one bone is going to make that big of a difference. I've been under chiropractic care my entire life, and I'm not willing to pour my heart and soul out to some poor intern at the student clinic and subject myself to this technique that isn't going to make a difference. And she said, if you don't get adjusted by Blair, I'm going to stop being your friend. And it was like this crazy ultimatum. And I believed her. I believed she would stop talking to me. And she was like a huge support to me in chiropractic school. So I didn't want to risk the rest of my chiropractic education and not having her in my life. So I said, fine, I'll go do it. Yeah. And I subjected myself to the student clinic and this doctor who's amazing, who practices in Washington, his name's Dr. Kevin Leach. He was my student intern and Dr. Todd Hubbard was my faculty doctor at the college they took my exam and they did my narrative they took my x-rays and thank god dr hubbard was there because if you were to look at my x-rays and you were a brand new chiropractor you wouldn't even see the misalignment but he had been in practice for more than a decade and was trained to see the you know insidious misalignment that existed in my upper cervical spine yeah we're talking millimeters millimeters millimeters. it's not even visible to most people and he saw it Kevin adjusted me and literally on the table, my life changed instantaneously. The depression and the suicidal thoughts lifted and I felt so much hope and joy. I'd never felt that before in my entire life. And I got off the table and I swear to God, the colors in the room were brighter and the sounds were clearer. And I knew that I had to spend the rest of my life doing what they just did. Yeah. And they were kind of like scared because I jumped off the table and I was like, what did you do to me? And they were a little overwhelmed with how excited I was. And they were kind of scared. They thought maybe I was upset. And I was like, you just, what did you do? And I was telling them how much better I felt. And like I said, in that moment, I knew that I was going to have to learn the Blair work and then practice that because that was what made that difference. And there was something very tangible in my body and my mind, and it literally changed the course of my life. So it was crazy. I was one year away from graduating. I was already in eighth trimester, and I immediately enrolled in the elective that, thank goodness, was happening at the campus. I took the class, and literally within four months, I became like the top student Blair doctor in the country. And... I was able to secure the Blair scholarship and they gave me money for my accomplishments and my desire to learn Blair. And it was absolutely incredible. I was able to bring like a record number of new patients to the student clinic at Palmer College just by simply going out and telling people about what it is that Blair chiropractic is. And this is in a town where chiropractic was founded, okay? This is in a town where there are literally a chiropractor, more like four on every corner. The school has all the chiropractors there that teach and and educate and train. And then you've got probably 700 chiropractors in the Quad Cities itself that practice chiropractic. And the population of Davenport, Iowa is like maybe a little over 70,000 at this point. So there's not that many people. If any place in the world is going to have a quote unquote saturation, it's going to be that place. And I was able to get 26 people to come in as new patients in the clinic and let me be their doctor, even though I was a student. It was pretty incredible. Yeah. Well, it changed your life like right away. It did. And that's why I am so excited 
excited that I came to California and I get to do this for the people that I take care of. So I moved to California with $2,000 of student loan money and I knew two people in Lakewood. And I started my internship and I hadn't even met the doctor that I was going to be interning for. It was insane. And now almost nine years later, I've had the opportunity to be a part of an incredible practice and build up an immense patient base. And I get to love on people every day and I get to care for people and I get to share the truth about what Blair Chiropractic is and how my life is a living example that chiropractic saves lives. Because without Blair Chiropractic, I absolutely would not be here. Yeah. There's a quote by that, uh, I forgot the guy's name, but he owns Virgin Airlines. Oh yeah. And one of his quotes is, uh, if someone gives you an amazing opportunity, take it and figure out how to do it later. Yeah. And that's pretty much what you did. You knew what the end result was. You had no idea how you were going to go about it, but it happened for you because you stayed on the path and that's pretty amazing. That's exactly what happened when I circled that date on the calendar the first day that I sat down at chiropractic school. I looked at October 24th, 2008, and I knew that that was the day I was going to become a doctor. And I had no idea all the struggles I would have to get through to get there, but it happened and I had that vision. And as soon as I got that adjustment, and it's crazy, October 27th, 2007, it literally changed my life. And less than a year later, I graduated and moved to California and the rest is history. And now there's thousands of lives that I've been able to touch because of the work that Dr. Blair did, that BJ Palmer did, that Dr. Hubbard did. And it's my purpose in life to be able to continue to educate people and Um, inspire people to understand what this incredible thing called Blair Chiropractic is. And that's why I'm so passionate about pouring into the next generation of students. And that's why I'm so proud of you because you're my first chiropractic son. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I get to live through you and what you do and everything you're doing on the East Coast. I'm like, I get to be a part of that because I got to train you and it's so rewarding. I shadowed you for two years. I was in your office for two years and I saw the most amazing things and especially when people did come in with the anxiety and the depression and people just literally like I'd be in the room and they'd just be crying their eyes out, have no hope and then you knew exactly what to do with those people because you've been there and you knew how to get rid of this depression And sometimes the miracle doesn't happen right away. Sometimes it takes a couple months or two, but you reassured them that their life is going to get better if they just hung on tight. And you've gotten thousands of people better at this point. You've saved so many lives. And it's just amazing to see. I saw that firsthand when I was just like starting to figure out what Blair was. And I had my own story, but to see it happen in all those people, I'm just like, this is the most amazing thing ever. Yeah, it's outstanding. And I just love what you're going to be able to do. I'm so proud of you. And I'm excited that the name of your podcast is expect miracles yeah because literally when you become a Blair chiropractic patient that's what you can expect is a miracle in your life in one form or another and like you said it may not be instantaneous like my recovery was but everybody's story is important and every journey is important and I love being a hope dealer I love being able to look somebody in the eye and tell them We're going to make a difference in your life. So I'm so excited. And thank you so much for letting me share my story with you. And thank you for letting me be a part of your life. And I am so thrilled to see you go and take what I've taught you and take it to the next level. It's going to be incredible. Well, thank you so much. Love you so much. I love you, Dr. Pekka. And I know you got to run, but you are more than welcome to come back anytime. And hopefully uh, we'll get you back on here soon. Yep. I got to get to the office and turn some power on. I love it. I'll see you soon, bud. Thank you everyone for listening. My private practice is located in New Jersey at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. If you have any additional questions about today's podcast, other episodes, or any questions about Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractic in general, feel free to visit my website at drkevinpecka.com or subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dr. Kevin Pekka. Hope you enjoyed the show. Cheers.